It's Minge. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ruth Weiss, director of the Center for Jewish Studies, the co-sponsor with the Program for Constitutional Government of the conference on the 50th anniversary of commentary, of which this is the opening session. It's my very great pleasure to welcome, along with everyone in this audience, the distinguished participants of the conference, and our special guests, Norman Podhoritz, who has been running the magazine for the past 35 years, and Neil Kozadoy, its longtime editor, who will be taking over as editor-in-chief on Norman's retirement this spring. We thank you very, very much for joining us and look forward to the discussions of the next day and a half. This, as you know, has been a year of commemorations. It's 50 years since the end of the war in Europe, and 50 years since the liber liberation of Auschwitz and the other death camps. In such a climate of remembering, it seemed appropriate to mark as well the anniversary of a magazine that was founded very much in response to those events in Europe, out of a sense that America could hold up a different model of Jewish-Gentile relations. The American Jewish Committee founded Commentary in 1945 as a journal of significant thought and opinion on Jewish affairs and contemporary issues, believing that whatever strengthened the political and cultural confidence of Jews in America would necessarily strengthen pluralism and the respect for individual freedom in the country at large. The surprising thing about this project is that with the passage of the years, the editors have championed the Jews and American democracy with an intellectual passion that far exceeded the expectations of their sponsors. Whereas subsidized culture often seems to encourage infantilization in its recipients, the editors of commentary have taken on increasing responsibility for their mandate. They kept sight of the fact that the main reason the World War did end 50 years ago and with the defeat rather than the victory of fascism, was because America had entered the war and fought it so tenaciously. Democracy has victories to commemorate only when the strongest democracy in the world acts as the strongest defender of democracy in the world. This lesson commentary brought to the fight against the, great, the second great totalitarian force of this century and to the argument against those who think that there is really not very much to choose from among competing political systems. Commentary has been the most influential Jewish magazine of modern times. It's also, I think, the first to enter the mainstream of Western intellectual discourse while trying to protect the Jews and the Jewish state. When we think of the relations between an ethnic or a religious minority and the majority culture, we're ordinarily faced with a choice between parochial self-interest and cosmopolitan assimilation. And all around us, we can see how ethnic minorities and claims of victimization may turn, excuse me, how ethnic memories and claims of victimization may turn minorities and their leaders inward 
against the world, while contrarily, Jewish intellectuals have often been quick to prove their worldliness by fighting for the interests of other people to the extravagant neglect of their own. Without pretending that it is always easy to balance competing claims, commentary has shown how loyalty to a particular cultural and religious tradition may increase the dedication to American strength and unity, and how the conservation of democratic values may be the special duty of those like the Jews who are threatened by its alternatives. And far from assuming a chauvinistic outlook, the magazine probably expanded its political horizons the more it concentrated on protecting its group and its country from harm. There are many of us here, writers and readers, who owe this magazine a greater intellectual debt than to any single teacher or institution. Personally, as a teenager, I learned to argue over its pages with my father and older brother, and my greatest ambition in life was to get to argue inside its pages. One feels indebted to commentary for helping to reshape the very function of the intellectual from an iconoclastic rebel into a vital guardian of the nation's freedom, and from adversarial critic into the creative reinterpreter of national values. As with any magazine of note, it has accumulated critics no less than admirers, and we are grateful that the best of them have also joined in our deliberations. In any case, commentary's dedication to the protection of our liberties it what, is what makes it of common interest to the Program for Constitutional Government and the Center for Jewish Studies, prompting us to organize this conference. And among the magazine's many accomplishments was to publish the article, Dictatorships and Double Standards, that first drew Jean Kirkpatrick to the attention of the White House. Although I'm sure that she would have achieved her preeminence in any case, I don't think that she regrets having her legend joined to that of the magazine. And I leave it to my partner in virtue, Harvey Mansfield, to introduce you to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth Weiss. It, it's, it's, it's a great and somewhat delayed pleasure to welcome Ambassador or Professor Jean Kirkpatrick to Harvard. She's uh, both ambassador and professor. Jean Kirkpatrick is a scholar who became a politician and, 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 and uh, achieved immoderate success in both these occupations. As a scholar, she graduated from Barnard College, and got her PhD in political science, actually in political theory, at Columbia. She is presently the Levy Professor at Georgetown University, and she's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And she's written some books. Um, Leader and Vanguard in Mass Society, A Study of Peronist Ar Argentina. Uh, and this is my personal favorite, Political Woman. When she was a scholar, she wrote Political Woman. Now that you've been a politician, are you going to write Scholarly Woman? <laughs> and she's written uh, Dismantling the Parties, Reflections on Party Reform and Party Decomposition, The New Presidential Elite, The Reagan Phenomenon, The Withering Away of the Totalitarian State, legitimacy and force, national and international dimensions. All these books. Now the transition from her life as a scholar to that as a politician, as Ruth Weiss mentioned, came about through the article she published in Commentary, <clears throat> making the distinction between totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. This article caught the eye of the ever watchful Ronald Reagan who was a careful reader of important journals and a close observer of the literary scene in New York. As a politician then, she became United States representative of the United Nations and a cabinet member at the same time in the Reagan administration. She now <coughs> writes a syndicated column and uh, I think she's well known as the author of one of the most powerful speeches in recent American political history in 1984, 
at the <clears throat> San Francisco Convention of the Republican Party uh, against those who blame America first. A scourge, this speech was, to partisan enemies, a delight to partisan friends, and an object of admiration to lovers of punitive rhetoric. <laughs> this woman has been much abused, not so much in politics as in academia, partly from those who believe political science has nothing to do with politics, but mostly from those who believe that a political scientist or any professor must have just one politics. Why are politicians less disdainful of political science than political scientists of politics? That's a problem for our understanding. How can we have a political science which is not disabled for politics, which is detached from politics but not disinterested in it? Gene Kirkpatrick is a solution on view. If we can see the solution, we ought to be able to conceive it. But sometimes, unhappily, it takes a while for science to catch up with truth. Well, the title of her remarks this afternoon is Political Culture and Foreign Policy. And also, in case she takes a wrong step or leaves something out, we have a respondent. And that's Professor Daniel Pipes, who is now editor of the Middle East Quarterly, and whose latest book, <coughs> forthcoming book, is Syria Beyond the Pe uh, Peace Process. Ambassador Kirkpatrick. Thank you very much, Professor Manfred. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. I thought of my topic as political culture and foreign policy in the framework of a consideration of what have neoconservatives wrought, or neoconservatism wrought, or what has commentary wrought. Um, and I, and I, propose to have some comments on all of those. I, um, I think that all serious students of politics understand that political culture is the ground of political regimes and that political regimes depend on culture to underpin and to reinforce uh, all of the sort of central concerns about and formulae, I think they're called, the myths. Who should rule? And how should they be chosen? And to what ends? And how? And why? And why should we obey? Political cultures, as we all know, define citizenship and the obligations of citizens their duties and their privileges. Um, no one has been clearer about the absolutely central importance of political culture to foreign policy or to policy or to the polity than, of course, Socrates, uh, who, in the construction of the ideal state, explains that a lawgiver and a ruling elite and a role system that sustains a division of labor uh, are all very important, but they're not enough to construct an ideal state. What is required and absolutely essential is a culture in which to ground the Constitution and its central roles, its central myths, and to justify its role distributions. And Socrates tells us, you recall, that all the, the entire culture of the ideal state, its songs and stories and poetry and games, must reinforce authority and all the associated values and habits and goals. And that the central principles of the polity should be protected from uh, all sorts of debunking and um, disrespect 
And uh, that in spite of the very best efforts to that effect, it is likely that even the most careful supervisors, rulers, will fail in this and that eventually the ideal state will deteriorate. It will collapse because the culture on which it rests and its central values, which are the very heart of the system, will in fact succumb to unplanned and unintentional change. And the cumulative effect of this change in the culture will um, destroy the ideal state and it will become something quite different. And eventually, of course, it will become something different again and something different, different again as each phase in the deterioration of the ideal state is each unplanned step, uh, unintentional change follows the next uh, until finally the ideal state has deteriorated into the ultimate uh, tyranny. Socrates reminds us that constitutions do not come from sticks and stones, but from the characters of men. Now, for in the Republic, and nowhere more than in the discussion of, of the deterior of construction of the ideal state and the deterioration of the ideal state, is it clearer than that, that the maintenance of culture is the absolute essential to the maintenance of a regime. And that if you want to ma maintain a regime, you must attend closely to the, uh, to the reception and respect and regard in the polity for the central values of that culture. Um, you know, he remind otherwise, it will change, and character will change, and the regime will collapse. Constitutions do not come from six or stones, he reminds us, but from the characters of men, which are themselves molded by the culture. Now, the struggle over culture is, a, is the most important political task, I believe. And I believe that this struggle of a political culture is what uh, the neoconservative uh, movement, if you will, was born uh, for, what it uh, devotes itself to, and uh, what Commentary Magazine, especially under the leadership of Norman Padhoritz uh, and Neil, have devoted themselves to. Neoconservatism you know, neo was born out of the struggle about what makes government legitimate. And it's been very centrally engaged in it ever since. It is, I think, an orientation, a sensibility, and an ideological um, tendency. It's a movement. Those are each different uh, phenomena, as everyone understands. Um, they each have consequences. The central tenet of the neoconservative position, I believe, is that ideas have consequences and that bad ideas have bad consequences and that, uh, not only that, but they have the most important consequences, that ideas shape the world, that ideas change the world, that, that they will change our world, and we should pay very close attention. Neoconservatism, I think, is an, and neoconservatives generally, are not idealists in the Hegelian sense, but they are convinced that politics is prior. Politics is prior, for example, to economics. Uh, that uh, politics is shaped above all by the understandings and the purposes of persons rather than, for example, by laws of history or uh, any other uh, historicist uh, forces. Neoconservatives, Commentary Magazine, attach great importance to how events are understood. 
and how situations are understood and how discussion takes place about uh, who should do what in different circumstances. You know, it's particularly important time, I believe, to consider political culture and uh, its function in regime stability because I believe that uh, we have seen just in the last two or three years, uh, two very dramatic examples of the collapse of powerful regimes in their full power, in fact, in po possession of their full power, after their ruling elites lost confidence in their understanding and in their purposes and dogmas. They lost confidences, for example, in the Soviet Union. I, be I believe that the central, definitive, final factor in the rather shocking, unexpected, final collapse of the Soviet Union was uh, the loss of confidence in the very top leaders of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in the rectitude of their claim to a monopoly of power. And once they lost a de determined confidence in that claim to a monopoly of power, I believe, and uh, claim to a monopoly of power in the empire, which they had developed as well, um, which they developed to demonstrate uh, not only that the triumph of Marxism-Leninism was inevitable, but that it was going to be universal as well. When they lost confidence, they let go. That's, I believe, if you read the, the um, um, writings and comments for Alexander Yakovlev particularly in those uh, last months of the Soviet Union, the, before they reached the edge off which they uh, finally stepped. Uh, it is clear that this supreme elite of this great Marxist-Leninist uh, power uh, you know, was uh, no longer uh, convinced that a party which had uh, uh, the views that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union had should govern, should use force. And he'd be, you know, so he raised such questions as, uh, as uh, how can we be certain what the moral law is? It's incredible to see a, a leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in his full powers begin to comment on the role of moral law in, you know, in history and in their decisions, uh, and, and to raise questions about uh, you know, what is true. He was, of course, the architect of Glasnost. I, I myself was uh, profoundly shocked when Mikhail Gorbachev assigned to Alexander Yakovlev the task of determining, investigating, whether it was true that Bukharin had been a spy for British intelligence. I, you know, that question uh, really uh, says it all uh, because it suggests uh, objective history and objective uh, truth available to investigation. And, uh, and, and I think it's fairly clear what happened to the Soviet Union. I think that uh, it was important to create the context in which uh, they might uh, get to those questions. And I believe that the American policy and a lot of other factors were involved here. But finally, it was, I believe, a change in the political culture of the ruling elite, which made the definitive difference. Something like this happened, in my judgment, in South Africa as well, where a regime in the full sort of possession of great power abandoned a monopoly on power. And they abandoned the monopoly on power because they were no longer persuaded. Key individuals at the apex of that system were no longer persuaded of the rectitude of their claim of a monopoly of power and of the rectitude of the whole uh, 
racist, uh, you know, institutionalized racist system on which that power rested. I had the extraordinarily good luck to, to spend two hours with uh, de Klerk, F.W. de Klerk, in the weeks that he had begun to think about truly, finally, taking the step to uh, disengage and to share power with the black majority. And uh, he was thinking about questions of uh, minority rights and majority rule and how to preserve uh, rights under conditions of um, a majority, assuming power which was a majority which you had until recently denied rights to. And it was uh, very interesting to me to see that uh, F.W. de Klerk had turned to the Federalist Papers, of all things. It made very good sense. And he had read a number of the Federalist Papers with great care. There are uh, you know, more heads of state who read more books, Harvey, and articles and papers than you might guess. Um, the, uh, the cultural underpinnings of these, of these regimes, having been withdrawn, of course, the regime collapsed. And, um, and, and that's now a very dramatic suggestion of the ultimate importance of political culture and its relationship to foreign policy and to a polity. Obviously, the policy is dependent on the polity. Its character, the polity changes dramatically and definitively. Policy is just going to follow, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, like a house on a California uh, cliff or something uh, well, in an earthquake. Um, they, I believe that the neoconservative movement, which, uh, we all know has leaders and has journals and has organizations and um, so forth, um, which we'll look at, I'll look at momentarily, um, was born in the culture, the tremendous cultural struggles in the United States beginning in the 60s. That's, uh, or, or at least uh, intensifying in, in nasty ways in the 60s. Um, and that in those struggles over culture, beginning in the let's say, mid 60s, late 60s, um, American character and the American Constitution and um, the American regime, if you will, are all uh, at stake. They, and I think that uh, the, the role of the neoconservative movement in this uh, conflict has been really extremely important. And to some, to one extent, it's been important because the, the uh, persons who organized, sort of first response, organized a response, they not only responded, they organized a response, have done it so extremely well. Neoconservatism, of course, has leaders, and the two most outstanding leaders of neoconservative uh, movement are, I believe, uh, Irving Kristol and Norman Podhoritz. I think there's general sort of uh, agreement about that. Uh, and it has journals, and it has a lot of other leaders, too, let me say, who are distinguished and important. Um, it, it's an elite movement, after all, so most of its uh, persons associated with it have been, in some sense, distinguished people. Uh, but the, um, the neoconservative movement has been, from its uh, sort of founding, uh, uh, similarly drawn or to several journals. Initially, I think the new leader was an important journal in the sort of uh, emergence of neoconservative perspective, if you will, because it's a perspective, too. Uh, and uh, partisan review in some of, its, um, uh, some of its manifestations, but not all. But it was, of course, uh, it has been, of course, commentary that has been central and, uh, and has, 
which entered the cultural struggle early on and has persisted until today. Uh, there are, uh, commentary has been most especially uh, centrally involved in the dim uh, dimensions of cultural analysis concerning foreign policy and history. And, uh, and public interest has, of course, been more concerned with policy problems of uh, domestic affairs. They're, they're both you know, very important, uh, and they're not the only important journals, but, but commentary has been central. And so I think it is appropriate that uh, there should be a note taken here of commentary's anniversary. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, that, that it is an appropriate time to do so. Irving Crystal wrote once that Americans had suffered a nervous breakdown from which they were slowly recovering in the early stages of this cultural struggle. Um, well, you know, neoconservatives like professors are people who think otherwise, and uh, I think otherwise. I don't quite agree with Irving about that, that uh, nervous breakdown. I believe that Americans have, in fact, uh, ha underwent a an assault of very great violence from which we are slowly recovering, but we are going to agree that we're slowly recovering. Uh, the seriousness of the assault, in my opinion, has been underestimated by persons who either have not uh, seen, did not watch the burned out uh, streets in Washington and the bombed out uh, buildings and university campuses or uh, the blown out windows uh, on uh, city streets in a dozen of our cities. The radical assault and the response, the neoconservative response, have been as broad as our culture, I think. And they have focused on a debate on three subjects, really, I believe. One is a debate about the quality of our own society, and that has been the most important central item in the debate. And so, you know, did, we de did we deserve to survive or not? Uh, second, were we such a sick, racist, materialist, imperialist society that uh, everything would be better if uh, this society simply collapsed? Um, second question, what about communism? Did it deserve, the Soviet Union, did it deserve to survive? The question doesn't have the same poignance now that the Soviet Union no longer exists and Marxism has disappeared from the Western world. And that's uh, from conversation, from discussion, um, from consideration, but uh, for all those years, that was a centrally important question too. Uh, what to do about the Soviet threat, we used to call it. Uh, we, when we talked to each other, and the third question is really how to protect Israel from destruction by some very virulent enemies with which it has been surrounded. Now, the, that may seem a question stuck on, but in fact it's an integral question and one of the important functions of commentary in my opinion, has been to, to integrate through its, the writings of its various contributors and the ongoing discussion through the decades, has been to integrate this discussion of, of the assault on Israel and the efforts of the Israelis to survive, the incredible uh, attacks organized and sponsored by that same power who was causing uh, us so much concern elsewhere in the world, the Soviet Union. Many people do not know and do not understand, uh, or if they ever did, they don't remember, that it was the Soviet Union that in the mid-60s, and that great, liber that great liberal, Nikita Khrushchev, who um, devised the strategy for the adoption in the United Nations of the Zionism is Racism Resolution, and who first in, and who introduced uh, the resolution 
that not only labeled Israel as a racist state, as Zionism is racism, but also justified violence in, in, uh, in demands on Israel because any violence is considered to be forbidden by the United Nations Charter unless it is uh, used against colonialism and racism. If it is used in colonialism, again, the struggle against colonialism and racism, then violence is acceptable. And Israel was defined uh, into this struggle against colonialism and racism, and therefore an appropriate target for violence. And, the, and a great deal of violence was mobilized, has been mobilized. Uh, not only verbal violence, but the most uh, concrete forms of violence by multiple terrorist groups, many of whom themselves were, I hate to say these things, they sound embarrassing to mention, but, but they were in fact organized and funded and armed and advised by Soviet specialists in third world operations. And, and they were, and, and one of the sort of principal dogmas of this campaign was that uh, Israel was not only a racist state, but it was, in fact, an Israelo-Nazi state. And so this struggle against um, Israel was in integrated by the Soviet Union into a struggle against the West, which was described, and the United States, which was associated with Hitler and with uh, Nazis and with racism and all those things. Does Israel deserve to survive? Um, Neoconservative movement, which is, is, is circled around Commentary Magazine and has been shaped by Commentary Magazine uh, through uh, the articles which uh, Norman and uh, all of his associates have written all these years. I asked one of my research assistants to copy for me about three weeks ago all of the articles which Norman Podhoretz himself has contributed to commentary since 1965. I just uh, chose a date. I have read that oeuvre. It's a, it's a very substantial, you know, it's a thick notebook. Um, and it uh, makes clear, clearer than, than memory alone can make, the extent to which by his own participation in this ongoing task of analysis and, and uh, mobilization and, um, and change and defense. Norman, Norman Padhoritz has guided commentary, in fact. Um, to say that uh, his efforts have been controversial is, of course, to understate. Neoconservatives are the least politically correct people in the world. And uh, Norman Padhoritz and Commentary Magazine are almost surely the least politically correct magazine and uh, editor in the world. Um, I um, think that goes almost without saying. The neoconservative movement hasn't been focused only in the United States, of course. It, it, you know, it was manifest in places like, uh, like London, where Mel Lasky uh, played a, a significant role in, in Counter Magazine and uh, in Australia, where uh, people like Owen Harries was active in the founding of Quadrant and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, so it, it's, a, it's a movement with some uh, presence in some other countries and a very broad mission and a portfolio that's uh, wide. It has commentary, has uh, participated in every phase of the definition and action of the neoconservative movement. Um, from uh, such uh, events as, as the, uh, the various wars and attacks on Israel, the uh, various wars and attacks on the Democratic Party. It is, you know, Irving Kristol has also described a neoconservative as a liberal who was mugged by reality. And it is a fact that, uh, that most of the 
persons associated with the neoconservative position were Democrats when they met each other. Uh, actually, that's uh, we uh, we had organizations that were not magazines as well. We founded an organization called the Coalition for a Democratic Majority very early on. CDM it was called, and, and when we were the arrangements for the founding of that organization were made, it reminded me a lot of the. G.K. Chesterton's description of the anarchist society's meetings and the man who was Thursday. No one knew who else would be a member, you know, until we appeared and, uh, and found out who was part of this conspiracy. CDM was um, a, 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 an event, actually, because it, it included some people who are much more distinguished than conservative, neoconservative intellectuals, included the Scoop Jackson and uh, Hubert Humphrey. You may not remember. I checked in relationship to this uh, conference. Uh, it included uh, Tom Foley as a member of the organizing committee, just in case, lest we forget. Um, and, um, and a lot of distinguished uh, scholars from a lot of distinguished institutions. Um, we had, anyway, um, the CDM was not graced by Irving Crystal's presence because he had informed us that he had abandoned hope for the Democratic Party. Once again, Irving was blazing a trail and leading away um, because before too long, most of us would follow him. Um, though we would never make another liaison with another party quite like the party of our youth, I suppose. That's, uh, the Committee on the Present Danger was a neoconservative organization which uh, played a significant role in the mobilization of uh, intellectuals and plans for the Reagan administration's response, only before the Reagan administration existed, to the uh, Soviet threat. The Neoconservative movement has, I believe, uh, made a major contribution to American political culture. I think that it uh, was important in the debate that uh, made the case for democracy and challenged the really very raucous Soviet claims um, and at a period of great Soviet expansion. Most people don't remember that the 70s were the period of greatest Soviet expansion and greatest Soviet danger. And they were also the period I, in, which, were, uh, which commentary moved into its uh, greatest productivity and greatest, uh, I think, influence and impact. Uh, it, uh, there is no doubt that uh, Ronald Reagan and the Reagan White House not only read dictatorships and double standards, uh, Ronald Reagan called back after he read Dictatorships and Double Standards and asked the man who had given him the magazine, who is he? Uh, this Gene Kirkpatrick. Uh, and uh, they, uh, when he was asked a good many times about the articles that somebody handed him that he'd been from commentary, who is he? Uh, and uh, it was usually the correct question. But uh, the, the commentary was, uh, was centrally important. And uh, I can't quite claim that Norman and Irving brought down the Soviet Union. <laughs> but if pressed, and if I had enough time, I think I could make a plausible case. Uh, certainly that uh, they were central in framing the debate, which inspired greater uh, unity and effort and strength in the Western world, and uh, certainly greater uh, solidarity, fidelity, loyalty to the West and institutions of Western civilization, and uh, including Israel, which is, we consider, a founding home place of uh, Judeo-Christian civilization and um, was central to the purposes of the Reagan administration 
And uh, all of these are the reasons that, in case you hadn't noticed, I'll end on a political note, uh, Newt Gingrich has been talking so much lately about the counterculture. Thank you. Now, Daniel Pipes for a brief response. Thank you, Harvey. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to first start by disagreeing with Gene on a minor point. I don't think that the most politically incorrect person today is Norman Pothorz. I think you'd have to agree with me that it's someone more of the ilk of Rush Limbaugh. And I think that connects to your last point, that one leads to the other. That what the reason why commentary had such a deep influence in the 1970s is that what it brought to this new political disposition was a rather high octane intellectualism, which it hadn't had before, and which over the course of the next 20 years uh, became much more popular and has now become uh, really quite populist. So what had been high intellectual and the, um, you know, the, the, the limited to the uh, precincts of Manhattan West Side Manhattan, has in fact become national. But my two main comments are going to be one on foreign and the other in domestic, since those are the two general areas you covered. Um, you made the very interesting point that two <coughs> important states, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> two important states have fallen <coughs> in recent years because of internal collapse, because the elites no longer believed in their mission, the Soviet Union and South Africa. That poses the question to me, which are the states that will follow? And three candidates come to mind. Uh, one your specialty, one my specialty, and one well, we'll just have to punt. Uh, starting with the third of those, it would be China. Uh, China, there is a, an aging elite uh, that clearly was part of a dedicated cadre of believers way back 60 years ago. Uh, that has turned towards the market, turned towards uh, prosperity, and seems to be likely to be replaced by uh, younger individuals who do not share that ideology. And so one wonders how much longer uh, the system as it now is can, can continue. Second is Iran. Iran, um, the, best ex <clears throat> the best analogy I can draw for you uh, to Iran today is the Poland of 15 years ago. The crisis in Poland really became severe when the workers turned against the state. And this, of course, was a very dire predicament for a worker state to have the labor unions turn against it. Well, in Iran today, it is the mullahs who are turning, the uh, religious leaders, who are turning against the religious leadership. Uh, and they're doing it <clears throat> for, for distinct reasons. They're doing it because they have an increasing sense that the population of Iran is getting pretty sick of Islam if Islam means what that regime is imposing on them. And the mullahs, the lower, the, 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 the mosque mullahs, not the ones leading the country, are saying to the leadership that if you continue along this path, <clears throat> Islam is going to be irremediably harmed. You better quit. You better pull out of politics and let politicians take over politics again. And the third example is Cuba, uh, where it would simply seem to me that, that failure, just general failure, uh, economic and other failures have have dissipated the, the will of the regime with the perhaps single exception of um, the um, supreme leader himself. On the domestic front, um, my question to you is, you, you mentioned that there was a radical assault from which we are only slowly recovering, by which you mean the, the counterculture of the 1960s, and we are getting over that. But I wonder, is that really so true? Or is it entirely true? Is it not also the case that the counterculture has taken over a variety of institutions in American life? Uh, most especially, I think most dramatically, the churches, the mainline churches, but also the art world, and to a certain extent, the me media, and to a considerable extent, the universities. Now, you premised the continuity of the state on the continuity of the culture. These are the leading institutions of our culture. These are the high cultural these, these are the leaders of, of high culture, of cosmopolitan, sophisticated culture. They are more than ever um, adversarial. They are counterculture. 
Do you suppose that they are slipping into irrelevance, or do you suppose they are going to live in an uneasy coexistence with mainstream culture, or do you think they are actually going to take over? And I'm particularly pleased to ask you this question here, since you are a symbol of those who have been hounded by the university, who have been uh, not allowed to speak by the university. So here at a leading university, I take advantage of the opportunity to ask that of you. Thank you. I, uh, thank you, Dan. I agree with you about China, let me say, uh, that it's, that there's this, uh, coincidence of a regime at the regime succession and generational change is I think nearly certain to produce very significant uh, change in, um, in China uh, in a state that began you know uh, from a lawgiver if you will Mao that uh, began with a great break with, from traditional culture uh, a generational change in that state particularly is likely to produce significant change, I believe. Iran, I simply defer to your judgment and I'm happy to hear it. Um, and um, with regard, I've, I've thought about, uh, of course, about whether our own, whether it's unduly optimistic to say that uh, our, we are recovering from the uh, intense assaults of the late 60s and 70s or through the 70s. Um, it, oh, you know, is that true or is it simply true that we've grown so accustomed to it we don't notice it anymore? I think, first of all, that it is a fact that uh, while the institutions you describe are uh, important, like the church and the universities are very important to our uh, high culture and the arts, and that the assault, the impact has probably been greatest there on our high culture. I don't think that the, actually I don't think that the assault lives on in quite the same way in our political culture. I think that the, there are, and always have been, some discontinuities in American culture which, uh, ha, which have had the effect of protecting our political culture. To, uh, in some interesting ways. And I, I believe that the political culture has uh, simply ridden out the assault on the rule of law you know, and majority rule and uh, the, the right that people were claiming to blow up buildings. And uh, I told Harvey Mansfield today that I Thinking, coming up here, I remembered his father, who was a distinguished and a gentle scholar at, and professor at Columbia, describing to me an, the occasion when Columbia was being occupied and he was in his office, where he often was, at the university. And when the word came that the building was being occupied and he narrowly escaped being really badly damaged by a blow to his head from wielded by an idealistic student uh, with a, a heavy brass uh, fire hose, the nozzle of a heavy fire hose. Um, well, I think, you know, I think that's past. I really think it is. And I think that maybe it's not, you know, maybe I'm being overly optimistic. But I don't think that the same kinds of demands are heard in way in the political system. And I don't think that the same assault on the parties, which are much more porous than they used to be anyway, it's hard to assault an American political party today. That's, uh, you know, I mean, they just disappear if you try to assault it. That's, and it's, it's, you know, unless you go to the very sort of central legitimizing principle, which is, rule of law and government, government by consent under a system of, of, that provides rule of law and broad participation in competitive periodic elections. Uh, unless, you, you know, unless you go to that principle, then the other principles are not going to do ultimate damage to our political system. And I don't hear people challenging that central position of uh, 
of uh, democratic government. Um, I, d I don't think I hear them even challenging, you know, the right to own property, for example. Uh, that that's, uh, yeah, proves how moderate the, the radicals have become. Uh, I don't think I hear them challenging the, uh, the freedom of assembly. Um, the fact that I, mean, I, I barely dare to note that I am, in fact, uh, being quietly permitted to speak here. That's, um, <laughs> The, uh, I never knew I was an inflammatory person, by the way, as long as I observed all the boundaries between the academy and politics. I didn't, uh, I never realized I was an inflammatory person. But I think that, uh, I, I think that we absorb, we've absorbed a lot. And uh, our institutions are very porous and they're very flexible. And there's something about our mass culture that, uh, soaks up almost any kind of insult, like a sponge and mixes it with Barney or something, um, so that it comes out not quite so malevolent as it was intended to be. So I don't feel that our political system, uh, the regime, if you will, is under the same kind of threat today and in the same kind of danger that I thought it was in, let's say, uh, you know, the 1968, through um, 75 or so period. Uh, I think the great danger I felt was to, the great danger was internal domestic in those years from about 68 to a, through Watergate. And then from about 1976 through about 1981, the great danger was international. And um, I hardly know what to make of it because I am not an optimist, but I don't really see any major threats to the stability of constitutional democracy in America today. Thank you. Professor Kirkpatrick has offered to take questions. And if you have a question, would you please come to one of the two microphones um, here on the ground floor, there, there aren't any upstairs, so if you want to ask a question from upstairs, please come down. Yes. Uh, before the Persian Gulf War, Western countries were instrumental in the military buildup of Iraq, and I wanted to find out your thoughts on current regulations on arms exports to such rogue countries. Let me say that I personally watched the participation of Western countries in the arms buildup in Iraq because part of that was while I was in the government, which is a good place from which to watch policy developments. Um, and, I, and the UN is a good place from which to watch because, uh, as you, you put it correctly, because it was Western governments. And uh, there were almost all the Western governments. The, British and the Germans and the French. The, uh, the French and the, you know, <laughs> during the long Iran-Iraq war, the French and the Soviets were the only governments that continually sold to both sides um, the, in large quantities of arms, let me say, and high-tech arms, the best they had. The, after the, with the end of the Iran-Iraq war, they, you know, uh, have been joined by, uh, by, they've continued to sell arms and uh, so have other countries. The reason that, that, that everyone always gave in those years was that Iraq, you know, Iran was on the verge of defeating Iraq and that the defeat of Iran by Iraq, of Iraq by Iran would be a regional catastrophe uh, that would spill way out of the region into the, you know, over Africa and Southeast Asia and South Asia. And I must say, I did uh, hear a very great deal in the United Nations from representatives of countries, South Asian countries with Muslim populations. Um, I heard a great deal about their concerns about the Iranian proselytizing and the agents of the Ayatollahs who were working their universities and their labor unions. And I heard in Africa um, concerns of African governments, again, with Muslim populations, about the, their worry about the, uh, 
propagandizing of, um, by the Ayatollah. So this fear of Iran was not limited to the Western governments, but it, but it included the Western governments. And the Western governments had the arms to sell, you know. Uh, I personally very much regret I, the arming of Saddam Hussein in the fashion that uh, he was armed by all of the Western governments, including our own. I think that, um, you know, surely it was portion of the arms that he used against Kuwait then. Uh, that wasn't what anyone expected. I don't know what anyone expected, but uh, I think that it's very short-sighted today to continue to sell arms to Iraq. I think that uh, we have, just as one country, um, provided more arms, more high-tech arms to more countries in the region than uh, I wish were the case, and Iraq is the one I most ardently wish were not the case. But, we, but I also know that it is absolutely unrealistic to imagine that we control the situation because every major arms producing country in the world sells in the Middle East to the governments in the Middle East who buy. And um, that's a fact of life. Uh, the French are still selling a, you know, a lot to Iraq. This, I think the only solution, frankly, to Iraq is, is to change the regime. The only, you know, the only really effective lasting political change is regime change. In fact, it's what's happened in the Soviet Union. That's a major political change. It's what happened in South Africa. That's a big change. That's not a little incremental change. If you had a different regime, well, then you might have people who wouldn't be so, you know, a government that would not be so dangerous to uh, yeah, provide arms. But this one is hopeless. Now, I don't did all right. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a question in the spirit of Norman Podhoret's articles you refer to in continuing some of the line of concern about the future of Israel. Right. And I'm glad and delighted you started from right. Socrates and right. Plato because kind of makes right. kosher hypothetical questions and right. hypothetical thinking. And here is a scenario I would like you and perhaps only Daniel, also Daniel Pipes to comment on. And a Republican candidate convinces you to become his vice presidential a candidate for president, to become a vice presidential <laughs> candidate, you don't want it, he says only one term, he gets elected, <coughs> he dies from heart attack, you are the president. <laughs> and Why do I do that? <laughs> here, here it comes, here it comes. And you choose Daniel Pipes as one of the people in National Security Council on Middle East. I you surely would. You convince him to no. continue a family tradition even so he was trying to get out of it. And here is the situation. You are informed by CIA and other sources that the attack on Israel is being prepared. You also know by this time that Iran, which you mentioned, got nuclear weapons directly from the Russian, not just as a byproduct of nuclear right, reaction, right. reactors are working now. Right. And they have been sending signals that even though they will not be first to use any nuclear weapons, they definitely will use any means should Israel use it first. Thus, de facto neutralizing Israel's nuclear weapons. Moreover, there is massive formation of Iraqi forces on far away from Jordan, just as a possibility. Same ditto for Egypt. In the meantime, Israel has given up Golan Heights. In Golan Heights are American advisors. The first group of advisors, advisors, uh, rather obser uh, observers, and, uh, have been already killed by the various groups at the disposal of Syria. Moreover, you discover they are like uh, the, in Vietnam, underground uh, passages in which many more advisors and consultants and arm and soldiers of America. The political culture of America is such we don't want any more Americans killed, you know they're going to be killed. And attack on Israel based from Lebanon. The others are just standing there, waiting, is imminent. 
Right. You ask Daniel Pipes to give you the options, what can be done, and will you discuss the options you will consider? <laughs> um, well, Dan, I think we're going to have to discuss this. Uh, <laughs> I would like to say that I, if I were the president, I would have withdrawn those Americans from all of those very exposed places. Are you already stuck? I would yeah, have yeah. done it already. I would have done it my first week in office. I would have removed those exposed American forces uh, from you know, places where just such, just such uh, fates could befall them. Uh, however, what are we going to do, Daniel? Yeah. <laughs> Since I, for some reason, wasn't able to do that. Huh? What are we going to do? We'll just make a recommendation. The attack comes well, mainly I, I from think, Syria. I think, I think you've raised this uh, whole scenario for a purpose, which is to point out the foibles of the dangers of, of, of the path which is currently being pursued. Um, clearly, there are dangers involved. Uh, the, the scenario you've raised is a somewhat unlikely one. But were we to assume that all you've said has taken place, I think uh, the Israeli nuclear deterrent uh, does remain in place. And at a certain point, what happens in the Middle East, as did happen in the U.S.-Soviet confrontation is that you ultimately must fall back on a kind of mutual uh, deterrence. Uh, if it doesn't work, if you have crazy states that are going to use the uh, nukes they have, there's they won't use it. Do. They just threaten to use it if Israel uses it. I, th I think, Dan, don't we uh, we we inform Saddam Hussein and any other potential major troublemaker in the area that uh, we will be merciless in a response should they uh, seize this moment to attack Israel, huh? or even Iran, for that matter. Um, that's one thing. For another, I, I myself believe that, uh, that it is a very dangerous policy which invites difficulty to station barely armed forces in almost any region of action, potential conflict. I think that we are uh, just on the edge of doing this now in Bosnia. And uh, I read in my Washington papers that we're about to do it next week, maybe even. Um, I think that you know, that will be a mistake. I heard uh, recently that we're about to station some observers, they're called now, on the border between Ecuador and Peru. Where, um, where they will get lost in the jungle and be eaten by mosquitoes. Um, and I don't think we should do that, let me say. I think there's a clear, I have some clear policy positions here. One, I think it's true, when, when countries in a region develop nuclear capacity, then they must live with uh, some sort of mutually assured destruction, you know, a, a, a mad kind of uh, mutual deterrence each understanding that the other has the power to wipe them out. And that's a fact. And so, you know, it, fortunately, we can assume that will be the case. I, I think it is very important that uh, Israel will have a capacity to defend itself to deter a nuclear attack. And as long as that is the case, I think that if we are prudent and not put our own forces in sort of harm's way, and that's, I'm not making just a statement about the, the goal line, let me say. I'm, I'm talking really about the world. Uh, then I think that we will not face this situation. I believe that if we have a government which is, like, has the unfortunate judgment to put American forces ill-armed into dangerous uh, situations in harm's way, as we used to say, uh, then I think they must be prepared to protect those forces with the full force of the United States, and they need to make that clear. Um, but that's what I think. Okay. Yes. You talked about the importance of culture in underlying a political system. And it has always been a truism, I guess, in American politics for the past couple of years that people vote with their pocketbooks. Um, a platform or a plank of the last presidential election was it's the economy stupid. But yet we've run through a recent election where cultural, is cultural issues, not the issues that you referred to in terms of rule of law, but um, maybe slightly less profound issues, such as the role of the family 
in uh, governance or how to deal with crime um, or the role of the state in supporting uh, the less fortunate among us have played a particularly strong role and economic, economic issues have played a less um, prominent role. Is that type of debate healthy in, if culture is what underlies our political system? And uh, if so, was the outcome a healthy outcome in which the um, one side of this cultural debate won and one side that lost for our political system? Well, the only thing I would point out, that, uh, as I did about Dan, to Dan Pipe's comment, it, the issues that were debated are relatively superficial issues which do not go to the base of the political system. They, you know, there, there was no uh, debate in the election campaign about whether we should abandon uh, the choice of rulers by competitive election and adopt instead, you know, uh, choice of rulers by uh, lot, for example, uh, or, uh, or by civil war. I mean, there, there was no challenge to the pol to the regime, and to the foundations of the regime, and to the basic institutions of the regime. The, the, those were not discussed. The cultural issues that were discussed were second or third order issues, like uh, you know, prayer in school, or uh, I, I don't know what issues were. Most of those issues, by the way, were settled at state levels. And if I have my way, they'll all be settled at state levels so it's, uh, before long. Um, but they, they are second, you know, second, third, fourth level issues, which are not, do not engage the fundamental principles of uh, democratic and constitutional government. That's the only thing I know to say. That, and there's never, there has not been, not since the Civil War, I think, has there been an election, the 1860 election, maybe, which truly engaged for one portion of the country fundamental issues of, uh, of democracy and rule of law. Um, I think that we got to the edge of that in 1968 with attacks on the selection process of, of uh, democratic candidates, for example, as in the Chicago Convention. But even that, I don't think, has been repeated since 1968, and I hope it won't be. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, it is hard to identify culture or um, to define it, just about as hard as it is to, to define a state or a nation. But recently, you've heard Newt Gingrich talk about the counterculture from Governix, and you and um, the other commentator have talked about the, the counterculture and the mainstream culture. But exactly what is this counterculture that we're talking about? And can you identify some of the tenets or the principles of it? And if not the counterculture, can you at least define some of the tenets of the mainstream culture <laughs> that we're talking about? Um, let me just say that uh, you, know, you have here on this campus a, uh, a scholar who has uh, done seminal work in political science on uh, the political culture, and the civic culture, and I speak of Sidney Burba, of course. That, um, the, and, and I think that in the simplest sense, what a counterculture is, is a, a counter to the dominant culture. I don't think that the countercultural movements have engaged the fundamental uh, issues of democratic selection and government since 1968, personally. Um, and I hope that they won't. But I think that, it, you know, what, what, uh, what Newt Gingrich is talking about in the contract uh, is talking about our second, third, fourth level cultural issues, as I was saying a minute ago. There were uh, issues about social issues and uh, you know, maybe in certain cases even religious issues. and. Then, um, I think that, uh, you know, that whether you ought to send people to war without guns, um, oh, you know, war light we're planning now in Washington. Did you read that the Marines are going to, to um, I don't know, Somalia again with foam 
laced with tear gas. That's going to be 200, we're now producing foam that's uh, 200 feet wide and 10 feet deep and, la and sticky and laced with tear gas. Um, well, there are some cultural issues, really, about whether you should use a military force to uh, you know, undertake uh, tasks that are not aimed at uh, coercion, in fact, really real coercion of an enemy. Um, there are some cultural issues about, there's, there's, there's sort of prayer in school issues, I think. I think that, you see, I think, though, that, that what New Gingrich is talking about, New Gingrich is a very smart man, let me just say this. Uh, he's, uh, in, I think what he's talking about, though, is the Clinton's roots in the counterculture of the of 1970, you know, and the 68, 72 period. That's what he's, I think, talking about. And I think he's talking about some of, also some of the, the roots of some of their, uh, uh, views of some of their, you know, some of their friends and some of their associates, but they, and they re relate back to that period, though, I, as I understand it, of the uh, counter when the counterculture was at its sort of height and um, and when they were trying to um, support the you know the candidates that were associated with the counterculture. All that sort of thing. I guess the main question then is, is there a mainstream culture that you can be counter to? Oh, I think so. I think so. And I think that, uh, I think that the mainstream culture is what candidates invoke and are understood to be supporting when they get elected. Um, that's one of the ways you know it's mainstream culture. That's uh, people. You know, you don't find majorities in most districts supporting uh, really countercultural uh, positions. Um, you uh, find minorities supporting countercultural positions. I think, but I think that, that Gingrich's comment about uh, counterculture related above all to the Clintons, though, and to some of the some of the you know some of the legal defense, but, but some of the the. Uh, approaches to welfare and so forth, which were rooted in the great society and which he thinks are a direct outcome of, the, of countercultural orientations, I think. Yeah. He hasn't been very specific, I might add. It's, it's an all-purpose term of abuse in Republican circles. That's, uh, 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 I take, I I'll take one more. Right. Yes. Uh, Who's there? Uh, Mr. Patrick, yes. would you care to comment, please, on the, the uh, tribalization of this planet, driven as it is by the population explosion, and how it affects our polity and uh, will affect our polity over the next hundred years in the in Europe, Africa, Asia, and sorry to say, in the Americas, simply because the uh, ever increasing number of small groups that have increased to the point of being a viable population as a self-standing population that will pose a threat to us as a nation, both because the concept of nation state will be under attack and the concept of the pluralistic society, which does not work very well without tolerance and true self-esteem. Right. Well, if, as I understand your question, uh, I would simply say that uh, we, we don't have growing populations, of course, in the, uh, in the Western world, generally. We have, and we don't have, the kind of population growth, if I understood you correctly, I, there was a, something I missed in the beginning, but uh, I, I think I, as I, if I understood you, my answer is that uh, population growth is best determined and, and controlled by development, that developed societies do not, generally uh, speaking, have uh, high population growth levels, much less out of control population growth levels, and that the uh, single best indicator, in fact, of a predictor of growth, population growth, is development level. And that I believe for a lot of reasons, including population growth, but for 
all, a lot of others that we could name, the, the principal goal that of our policy toward, in the third world and toward the third world should, in my opinion, be to promote economic growth and development. And with that will, go, uh, will come all sorts of other desirable consequences, including declining out of control population growth rates. May I point out to the, uh, to the a couple of examples, a couple of examples that are that actually do negate that, and that is the uh, the, in Canada, the Canadian uh, Quebec situation and our the, the history of Yugoslavia. Both are rather well developed. Both d uh, are showing signs of uh, creating disintegration that already occurred in Yugoslavia. Possibly it will occur in Canada. These are examples that hit home. And they are not something my, in the third My world. response to that is not well developed enough. <laughs> Thanks very much for these thoughtful remarks.